Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church Bible Study. Good to have you here this morning, this September morning. Looking for the fall to come within a month or two. Amen. And we have we have early summer in Texas and midsummer, late summer and post late summer. And then we we go on into that. So it's always good. In Florida, my mom and dad always said that that uh Florida was the was the place of three seasons. It was spring, summer, and rainy. And so that was the rest of it. Colossians chapter number one, we're glad to have you here with us. We're going to move down. We talked to you a little bit about the book of Colossians and about um, what what the Lord has for us in the book of Colossians last week. Uh, this morning, we, we were going to go, we're going to start right where I left off and real quick. And if you have your Bibles there, look, we're going to start. Verse, we went through the seven part prayer of the Apostle Paul. We got down to all six of them and I stopped on the seventh one. All right. In, in, in the seven, that, that joyful in their presence and long suffering. Look at that chapter number one and then verse number 11. He's saying that strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Amen. If you're like me, I want patience and I want it right now. Patience has a perfect work. You know, it's one of the few things in your Bible that it says that patience is a work. Come back tonight, we'll talk about it. Patience is a work. It is so hard to wait. Did you ever raise a kid? Hmm? Yeah. One of the things you said to him over and over and over, in a minute. In a minute, right? Just be patient. Anybody ever said that to your kid when you were raising them? Just be patient. You know? We're working on it in a minute. As Christians, that must be how God feels with us all the time. Okay, just a little bit, okay? You heard the story, didn't you, about the guy praying and God answering him? He said, God, you know, how much is a million dollars to you? He said, it's just a penny, my son. He said, well, how long is a thousand years to you? And he said, it's just a minute. He said, well, can I have a penny? And God said, in a minute. Amen? Amen. That's what I'm thinking. We don't have much patience. And Paul said, with our patience and long suffering, that, that's the same word. The ability, now, I'm, I want you to get the long suffering is not, is not like when we say suffering. When I'm telling you that you know, that animal was suffering or this person's suffering, you're thinking about pain and what level it is, Right? Come on. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. You're thinking about what this is. This is a, one of those things that has the ability that, that, that you have patience, that you're long suffering with it. Those two words go together. Just, you know, how long can you, you say, well, preacher, it just kills me to have to wait. And that's what he's talking about when we're working in the Lord. God will make sure that you get patience. You know what brings patience? According to the word of God, tribulation worketh patience. And he will make sure that you have some kind of tribulation in your life that you'll learn to be patient. <clears throat> you'll not learn to be patient with other people if you first don't learn to be patient with God. God, God can do anything. I have no doubt about that. <clears throat> but he, I have never known him call me in the morning and say, God, George, what you want me to do today? God has a will. I'm in that will. You're in that will. And the hard part is, is waiting to see what he does with us. We always sing, oh, to have the patience of Job. Have you read Job? He was not patient. He complained and he griped and he accused God. Sounds like us, amen. But I want you to move forward with me just a little bit here, will you? And before we get into that, I want you to look with us that in this long suffering that he has out there, you look with me in chapter number uh 6 and verse 4 of 2 Corinthians. I want, to, I want to show you chapter number 4, 2 Corinthians. And of course, you've got to move backwards toward the front of your Bible now. 2 Corinthians in chapter 6 and verse number 4. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, and we're going to read down a couple of verses. It says, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience. One thing I believe the whole world expects out of us is patience with them. 
Then he lists out all the things we're supposed to be patient in. In tolments and labors and washings and fastings and pureness and by knowledge. Okay. And long suffering. If you looked over at chapter number 12 and verse 12 in the book, same book, chapter 12 and verse 12, he said this. Truly the signs of the apostles were wrought among you in all patience. You know what he said? We had to be patient with you. Because most of you didn't get it the first time. Matter of fact, if you ask most Christians, there's very few of us like me that I got saved the first time I heard the gospel. Not many people that I know or have heard of or talked to have ever done that. Most of the time it took two or three different times. Somebody working with you, praying for you. Some of you, it took years. I, we have families in our church that I went by and visited them for more than 10 years before I won them to Christ. In much patience. So when we're talking about the joyful impatience and long suffering, willing to, willing to pay the price, that's kind of what it means. Are you willing to pay the price? And you say, well, preacher, you don't understand. Yes, I do understand. And I promise you that God has a plan. And you say, well, what if your promise is no good? By then I'll be in heaven. It won't make any difference, will it? But I promise you the scripture says God knows what he's doing. He doesn't make mistakes. He hasn't forgotten you. Remember Jesus saying, you're worth more than many sparrows. He takes care of a sparrow. He takes care of you. Now let's look down again at this. We're going to go to verse 12. We're going to start a new section. The exaltation verses. I, I, want, to, <clears throat> I want to read those for you. Giving thanks unto the Father. See, we, we went from patience now to giving thanks. Which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Made us meet. We met the standard. How do we meet the standard of God? He did it. And then He gave it to us. It's going to cost you ten bucks to get into this place. Here's ten bucks. That's what He did for us. When we had no righteousness of our own, and we owed a sin penalty to begin with, He paid the sin penalty, and then paid our righteousness for us, provided it for us. He hath made us meet, we met the standard, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, if you look up here, this whole section can be clouded out in about three statements. Cleansed by His blood, sealed by His Spirit, resurrected by His power. He took care of all of our sin, takes care of us while we're in the world, and He's going to take care of us when it's time for us to leave the world. That's, that's what the section, did, the exaltation of Christ. Verse 13, who had, look at this, Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, that we be, should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom he also, ha, have you guys ever seen the guy that does the silhouettes? He finished one the other day of former President Trump. And you say, and he, he makes them out of wood stumps and stuff. Y'all look that up on the internet sometime. And he does it with a chainsaw. There used to be a guy down on uh, 287 between here and Midlothian that he, he, he made all kinds. They, I, he had a big bear he made out of this huge tree that was about that tall. And I, I would have loved it. And he made it with a chainsaw. Can you, can you imagine? <laughs> no. He, I'm serious. If you've seen those things that people make, where, do, where does that talent like that come from? I can't even cut the wood straight across a log. It's funny. It's thick. You know what I mean? And he's, he's out there going, and how does he see it? Well, Michelangelo said it this way. They asked him, he said, how did you come up with this great sculpture that you made out of some rock that he picked? He go, well, all I do is I just see it in my mind and then I chip away the parts I don't need on it. Mine would look just like a rough, rounded up piece of rock. You know what I mean? What is that? This is, this is a pre-statue statue. But, but he said, who had delivered us from this, that has made us meet to be partakers. Ephesians said that it should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Do you understand to the praise of his glory what it took for God to get you here? You know what's wrong with your kids? 
You know what's wrong with your grandkids? They will not realize how wonderful you are until they're in the same spot you are. I only had a couple of kids and helped in raising a few more, but I'm telling you, it makes me look back at my mom and dad thinking, how did they just feed us? How, how did they, were they able to do that? Just feeding us, housing us, clothing us. How did they do that? No wonder that we thought maybe they were working night and day. They were. You know what it took to God get God, us where we are? Come on, when you read a scripture, guys, think about what he said. Giving who hath made us meet, that you should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in his Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you're the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Here's the three things up here that we're talking about. In whom after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. Resurrected by His power. So we're promised not just a, a pass out of hell. We're promised a place in heaven. We're promised eternal life in the presence of God. We're promised that as long as we're here, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. You can't lose you. You can't pull. The scripture says no man can pry you or pull you out of the Father's hand. You'd have to be greater than God to do that. And then it's not done. And he's saying, look, it's not over. Okay, you passed away and you went on to heaven yet. But you still got a brand new body to come. There's a resurrection day. And Paul said that we all not suffer like others that have no. We have a hope. That we're all going to see each other again. That know the Lord. We're going to be with the Lord in a brand new body made without hands, eternal in the heavens. That's good stuff, isn't it? No wonder Paul would say, giving thanks to the Father. And then verse 13, look down there with me in this. It's Well, let me give you the verse and we'll move forward. In. And to wait for his son from heaven. Here's that thing. Patience thing. Who wants patience, right? Anybody ever paid for, prayed for patience? Every day. That's where that tribulation comes from. And that's where it does. God puts things in your life. Now, every once in a while, God reminds me how inadequate I am. Now, I have, <clears throat> I'm rebuilding an 80 year old Ford tractor, putting it back together. All right. Those tractors were built like Jenga puzzles. If you touch one piece, all the rest of them fall. I'm serious. So I, I needed to replace one extra long bolt about that long that's threaded on both ends. The trouble is, when they put it together, the only way they could make it work is underneath all the housing, they put a keeper pin across that bolt head, and you have to get inside to do it, take it off. Where when you pull off the top, the top comes off, the bottom comes, pieces on the bottom all falling. <laughs> it looks like a pile of jingle blocks when, and it just keeps falling apart. Now I was holding pieces of my hand, you have the little tiny piece, it's no bigger than a, like a chapstick, okay, like this. It all hinges on this whole thing, sliding in and out of a hydraulic cylinder, like that. Makes it work. Inside of that is a little push bar that's about the size of two toothpicks. And it's got a spring on it that makes it fit tight. And you have to find a little hole in the bottom of it, looking up the little peephole about that big, trying to figure out how to get that little clip in there, okay? Well, I, I was taking it out, looking at it like that. And I'm standing in front of my shop. You guys got to be in. You know what the shop looks like down there, Brother Bob? Okay, all of you, all right? And I'm pushing down, figuring, how can I get that to stay like that? And it slipped off my finger, and the spring went, mm -hmm. It's two days later, I still hadn't found the spring. But a whole bunch of times I've said, are you still laughing, God? You said, do you ask the Lord to help you find it? Well, you know what? I didn't. It was just absolutely too stupid this time. You know what I mean? Soon as I did it, I, I knew, never pull down on a spring because you know it's going to flop off your finger, right? 
It, everybody's anybody here that's worked on anything and never done that before. That's what I thought. We have all that stuff. You see, what's this got to do with what, what we're talking about? <clears throat> that's our whole life without God in it. You know what I mean? You say, how much does that matter in the eternity of everything? Evidently, it must be a lot because God puts us through it a lot of times. And it might not have been a spring in your life. It might have been just one little thing you didn't do or one little thing you did do that makes a difference right now. Hey, what do, what do we do? I, God, in our life, did a whole bunch of little things and sometimes we don't even notice them. You, you think that tractor piece is like a Jenga puzzle. You ought to see what it took for God to get your salvation in order. I mean, if he'd have missed one little spot, one little thing, going back to creation. Do you know what I, if, I remember the first time I realized in my life that if water was made out of anything besides two super explosive materials, oxygen and hydrogen you know because you can either get you can get two things when you put those two together you either get water or you get fire y'all know that same materials y'all all right think of the Hindenburg hydrogen field all right I realize that God made water out of that for a reason. Once you get your chemistry stuff down, you got to work on that. Now, what happens when you freeze water? I, I don't know of any other material. You might think of something, but this compound, once you freeze it, gets bigger. That's an unusual thing. The colder it gets, the, the bigger it gets. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. But I remember finding out thinking, ha, huh, you know what? If God hadn't made water get bigger when it freezes and water went to, saw, and ice went to the bottom of the oceans instead of, there wouldn't be any life left on the whole earth if he'd have got one little tiny detail. Just one part of you out there going, what did you say? I'm, listen to me, guys. It's, it's an amazing issue it, I, I, to think about the wisdom of God. You know, you know what they shoot rockets into space with, right? You say, well, yeah, what? What is it? You ever notice that stuff that comes out of a when NASA lifts off a rocket? That's water vapor because they're burning the two really cool things. They're putting hydrogen and oxygen together, pushing that thing out of there. But when, it, when they're water, they put out fire. When they're water, they expand when they're cold. When they're water, isn't it? Have you ever thought of that? That's just one little detail. wonder how many hundred million. That's just in creation. What about in our salvation? Look at the verse. To wait for his son. And, and there's a million. Once you figure out in your lifetime from heaven, whom he had raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Our whole purpose in the world is to be ready for his coming. When he comes, you guys can have the factor. One, whoever's here, it's yours. Y'all heard me say it. Of course, most of us will be gone, right? Tommy Stone used to sing about the atheist. And he'd say, you know, you're always wanting to get rid of the churches. He said, when Jesus comes, we'll be gone. You can come and take the church, make it into a skating rink if you want. It'll all be left here, but we'll be gone. And that's and that's just one verse. Look at 13. I Let's move on. So, <clears throat> Who delivered us from so great a death, and yet doth deliver, and whom he will yet deliver. That, look at verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. How many ever know where Elijah went when he went up in the chariot fire? With where would he go? What's the Bible say God did with him? Anybody remember what the word he said? 
There was an Old Testament saint named Enoch that never died. The scripture said, and God took him. Translated him, didn't he? See what it said? God translated him. You see, what's that mean? Uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking that means he put him someplace else, right? Besides where he was. He has a purpose for those people. Or he had had them done, not taking them out that way he did. We'll talk about that in another thing. But look at the word now. Who had delivered us in the power of darkness and had, there's the same word, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We, we went, without leaving the world, we went from not being a part of to being a part of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we switched citizenships so much so that Peter and the rest of them would say, <clears throat> we're now pilgrims and strangers here. You fit into the world? I can't even figure out how they're thinking. I can't think they are thinking. None of the, most everything that's happening around our world right now doesn't make sense at all. He said that he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And I, I want you to look at another verse for, and such were some of you. Think about this. This is where we were at. But you're sanctified. That word means set apart for a purpose. But you're justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Isn't that cool? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Sealed. Some of you say, well, preacher, you big deal. You know what I mean? Well, it is a big deal to me. Because that's what we're talking about. The exaltation of Christ. What made this happen was God sending His own Son into the world for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's a pretty good plan. You say, well, I got a better idea. I'm not thinking you do. Look at the verse 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, I, I witness to people all the time, and I've had people in my home this week working on things and doing things. And the first guy I talked to didn't have any care at all about any, all that stuff was foreign. Don't care about it. No, Nothing to do with any of that. And I <clears throat> talked to another one that was there doing work on the, my house. And... Uh, he told me that he was one of the chosen. He was one of the chosen. And I said, well, where do you go to church now? He said, I don't go. No point on it because I'm already chosen. So <clears throat> how about your wife? Do you, are you married? Oh, yeah, she's chosen too. And I said, your kids, they're all chosen. I said, you know what? I have never talked to anybody who was a Calvinist who did not believe that they were not one of the chosen. One day, I want somebody to come to me and say, only a certain select few are going to get to go to heaven, but I'm not one of them. I just want all you guys to know that I'm not one. Have you ever noticed? They're always one. They're, they're chosen ones. None of them are not the unchosen I said, well, you need to get your family and get into church. He told me where, uh, you know, his, that his membership was in a church. And uh, I said, well, why don't you go there? No need in it. I'm already done. I'm already finished. Now, there is a reason. Look at what I have in verse 14. In whom we have redemption. We have a kinsman redeemer. All that Old Testament things about a kinsman redeemer and everything they did and everything they could do and all that happened with that. Do you understand that was a reason? If you were one of those Jewish people and you were sold to another Jewish person, which was, they did it themselves. Nobody sold it. Most of them, they went and sold themselves. That you could be redeemed out by anybody that was anywhere close to being kin to you. And the guy who paid for you, that took you into bondage, had no choice but to turn you loose. 
It wasn't like he could say, man, no, I'm not. Yeah. Once somebody would pay that penalty you owed, and it was one of your kinsmen, you had to turn him loose. Well, in Christ, if you're Jewish, you're connected together through Abraham. If you're in Christ and you're not Jewish, then you're connected to him through Adam. So the whole world is a kinsman. And for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. When he came out, he redeemed him out. Now, I want you to get this. You could say, Lord, I really appreciate you paying me out, but I really like being a slave. You could say that to your kinsman redeemer, and God made a way in the Old Testament where those people could do it. And that was the sign of an earring in a man, was that he voluntarily became a slave to a master because he wanted to be the slave to the master. Now we, we see that same earring on them. It's not a piece of jewelry anymore. It's the smell of cigarettes and the smell of alcohol and the, the average of drugs and but see, that's what they've done. They've taken, they have to, they've taken some kind of mark to do it. And you can tell it. But he said, we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 3. And the wonderful thing about it, are you listening? The wonderful thing about it, is God used that picture type for us. Now, I'm saved, and I'm on my way to heaven. If you know Christ, your Savior. But I am still in the world. You ready? I'm still here. I'm going through the same problems, and I have the same things, and a lot of the same problems that, you know, my loved ones died just like lost people's loved ones died. My people that get sick, and we have those things, we have money troubles, and we have problem things, no matter what we do, as long as we're in the world, we're going to suffer the things of the world. In that Old Testament picture, let's go back to that slave, that one who was totally paid free. You ready? If while he was in slavery, listen to me, guys. He was redeemed out and he could walk away. But he said, no. If you go back and read that real close, there's a. it wasn't because of the sin. It's because he could say, I have married a wife and I have children. And she was a slave. And for their sake, I'm going to stay here and serve for them. Wait, the picture just changed, didn't it? He's still redeemed. He's still paid for. But he's got a, something way higher of a cause than just sin. That now becomes a picture type of our Lord Jesus. Did you listen to me? He didn't have to do this for us. He could have come in and paid for us and walked off and left. And you'll find it says in the Old Testament that his, my ear hath he opened. You know why? Because as long as we're here in the world with us, the verse says, the forgiveness of sins, the presence of the Lord, the redemption of the purchase continues in full force. Till we leave. When his wife got freed from slavery, he was already freed and he could just go out with her. Isn't that a cool picture? It really is. And as long as we're in the world, he still keeps paying the price. And every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that's what we celebrate. An unlimited amount of forgiveness through the redemptive price that's paid for us. 
Every Gentile ought to stand up and shout about that. Because that's what the scripture calls us, is the bride. He just hadn't taken her away yet to become his wife. It's, could you understand why you would say this is uh, the exaltation of Christ? Again, three verses in 25 minutes. That's what we have. And that's why Paul would say, and David would say, and Peter would say, meditate on these things. Next time you're having like a really crummy day and you think nobody cares, go back and read those three verses over. Somebody has got into a lot of trouble because they love you enough. They paid more than the universe. The creator of the universe gave himself for you. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. And Lord, we have to stop and to remember. Maybe that's that patience thing you told us we had to have. Not just to be patient with others and patient in the world, but patient with our own selves. We're looking forward to that. Paul would say, you know, it's for me to live as Christ. It's harder staying. And I think sometimes as Christians, we, we want it changed right now. Remind us of why we're still here and what your purpose is in having us in the world. And, and, and we're as secure as if we were by your side. Bless us, Lord, as you use us in the world and, and we exalt the name of Christ. I don't think my words can adequately explain Lord, how wonderful a God you are. And we pray all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. That's good stuff, ain't it?